Hello students, I want to do a quick video introducing experiment one and the major concepts that you're going to be talking about with experiment one. This experiment is about spectroscopy or spectrometry, which has to do with light and the way light interacts with matter. So I have a few quotes here about light and my favorite of them is there is no darkness so dense, so menacing or so difficult that it cannot be overcome by light. For today's experiment, we have several learning objectives. And as a reminder, each week when we have the pre-lab video, I share these learning objectives with you and they are used to write the exams for the course. So the specific things that we talk about in the pre-lab lectures today will also be related to things that you'll, you'll be asked to do on the exams for the course. So today we're going to be talking about spectroscopy. So the first thing is explaining why each substance has a unique absorbance spectrum, predicting the colors that are absorbed or transmitted if you're given the other using a color wheel, explaining factors that affect absorbance based on Beer's law, performing serial dilutions, explaining how spectrometers measure light transmitted or absorbed, and then our process skill that we're going to work on today is oral communication. So first I'll introduce this process skill of oral communication. And after class today, you'll have a short quiz on Learning Suite where you'll be asked to rank yourself based on your oral communication skills that you used in lab today. Oral communication can be divided into four parts, speaking, listening, nonverbal, and response. And so I've, I've put here the description of what a five looks like. Obviously you can do these less perfectly and so then you might rank yourself lower, but I'll tell you what the, the objective is, what we're going for. So with speaking, we want you to express complete thoughts about concepts with relevant and effective language. So in other words, since we're talking about spectroscopy today, you should use words like absorbance and transmittance and photons and concentration and path length and all of those technical words that you'll learn in correct ways and in complete thoughts when you're discussing this with your lab partner. Listening is effectively listening to all group members, explaining their ideas without interrupting them. So being aware of uh, other people when they're speaking, paying attention to them, listening to their ideas and not interrupting them. Nonverbal is about things like eye contact, nodding or gesturing, uh, responding to other people when they're speaking so that they know that you're listening instead of, for example, like staring down at your lab notebook and, and sort of ignoring them. Response means that you're promoting the exchange of information. So you might, for example, respond to something your lab partner has said by checking to make sure that you heard them correctly or that you uh, understood what they were saying or uh, restating the things that they've said to make sure that you got it right, or continuing their idea and building on what they've already said. So that idea that this is sort of a two-way conversation and you are responding to each other. And again, at the end of class, you'll have a short quiz that you'll do on Learning Suite where you will be asked to rank yourself and then also provide evidence to support your ranking. So give a description of something that you did in class today, where you demonstrated this skill and that's relevant to that specific piece. So for example, under speaking, you'll rank yourself and then you'll have an opportunity to describe why you gave yourself that ranking for speaking. Spectrometry has to do with photons or light and the way that light interacts with matter. And in particular in this class, since we're looking at UV vis spectroscopy, we're gonna be looking at electronic transitions. So just a refresher from Chem 105, you have molecules and they have a ground state, which is where the electrons are in their lowest energy state and where they're sort of normally found. Uh, and you also have excited states, which will be higher in energy than the ground state. And the electrons can be forced to move from the ground state to the excited state if they receive enough energy and uh, exactly the right amount of energy to make the jump from the ground state to the excited state. In our case, we're going to use light to do this, but it can also be done with heat or electricity. So looking at these two molecules, A and B, take a moment right now and think about which one would emit or absorb a longer wavelength. And which one would emit or absorb more energy?
So you can see that molecule A, there's a shorter distance in energy, a, diff, a, a smaller energy gap between the ground state and the excited state than there is in molecule B. So we expect molecule B would require more energy to get from the ground state to the excited state. And in terms of wavelength, energy and wavelength are inversely related, so the longer wavelength would be for molecule A. And in fact, in this case, molecule A absorbs red light, molecule B absorbs blue light. Now the question is again, what color would these molecules appear? Again, molecule A absorbs red, molecule B absorbs blue. So take a moment and think about which color the molecules would appear if you were looking at a beaker full of that molecule. So because molecule A is absorbing red, it would appear green. Because molecule B is absorbing blue, it would appear orange. And this is based on the color wheel. So we have the color wheel in the bottom right corner here. And uh, the opposite colors are the way this interacts. So if something absorbs red, then it will appear green. If it absorbs blue, it appears orange. If it absorbs yellow, it appears violet and vice versa. So the opposites on this color wheel are uh, what determine the color that things will appear based on what they absorb. You can make a color wheel of your own if you just make a pizza with six slices and you put Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, in the little pizza slices, then you can see uh, what the opposite color is. There are numbers on this color wheel indicating the nanometer ranges for the wavelengths for those colors of light, and we don't ask you to memorize those. We will tell you if something is green light, we'll say, we might give you the wavelength, but we will also say that it's green. Okay, um, so our experiment today, we're gonna be using spectrophotometry. And in this case, we're using UV invisible light to identify and quantify chemicals that absorb light during electronic transitions. And this is one of the solutions that we'll be using in lab. It's a cobalt 2 plus solution, so cobalt nitrate. And it appears a really pretty pink color. So if it's appearing pink, we'll call that red. Then what color do we think it should absorb? And hopefully you say green. Uh, it should absorb green because that's the opposite of red. And of course, these colors over here on the right, if these colors are the light going in and these are the light coming out, this is what we call transmitted. The green light that gets crossed out here is what we call absorbed. And we use a spectrometer to measure this. And the spectrometer that you'll use in lab is literally a small black box. And this is a diagram of what's going on inside the spectrometer. So you have a light source and it makes white light. Uh, so it makes all of the colors of the spectrum. You have a slit that makes that turn into a beam. And then you have a cuvette holder. And this is where your sample will go. You have a small cuvette, which is sort of like a square test tube that you'll put in there and the light will shine through it. And then based on whatever light passes through, the transmitted light gets separated out into the colors of the rainbow using the diffraction greeting. And it will be detected with a sensor over here. And the spectrometer will compare the light transmitted when you have your sample inside versus the light transmitted when you had no sample inside. So that's why you'll have some calibration that you'll do right at the beginning. Uh, to make sure that it knows how much light should go through if there was nothing there. Okay, when we have this information from the light sensor, it gets converted into a spectrum. And so you'll see something that looks like this. And this is in fact some of that cobalt nitrate solution, that pink solution. And you can see it does in fact absorb a lot of green light. The peak is kind of spread out, so um, it absorbs a little bit of the blue light as well and a little bit of the yellow light, but green is where the peak is. And that's sort of the one that we're most interested in. And we can also 
in the software that you're using, you can click on a button and it will change it from absorbance to transmittance. So instead of showing us what light gets absorbed by the solution, we can see the light that gets transmitted or that makes it to our eyes. And this makes sense for the cobalt solution because you'll see there's a lot of transmitted red light and a little bit of transmitted purple light, which gives it that kind of pink color that we see in our solution. We can use Beer's law to relate the absorbance of a solution, the measurement that we make quantitatively, to the concentration of the solution. And they are, these are directly proportional. So absorbance is directly proportional to concentration. There's two other things in this equation. One of them is epsilon, which is our molar absorption coefficient. And this indicates how strongly the molecule absorbs a certain color of light. Some molecules will absorb light more strongly than other molecules. And some molecules absorb light of one wavelength, but not of another wavelength. So for example, if we look back at our spectrum, we expect the epsilon for the wavelength around maybe 510 or 515 here to be really high, but we would expect the epsilon for 680 to be really low because there's not very much absorbance at 680. So epsilon tells us how strongly the molecule absorbs a certain color of light, and it does vary depending on wavelength and depending on what kind of molecule you have. Different molecules will have different characteristic spectra. C is our concentration, it's measured in molarity, and L is the path length, or how far the light has to pass through the solution. In our experiments, it's one centimeter, and that's pretty common for UV vis spectroscopy, um, but it could vary depending on which kind of cuvette you use or which instruments you're using. And each of these factors will affect the absorbance directly. So if we have a longer path length, if we have a larger epsilon, if we have a greater concentration, all of those things will affect the absorbance. So I have a couple of practice problems here for you, three steps of practice problems and this data. So go ahead and pause the video here and see if you can solve these uh, problems using Beer's Law. Based on our first sample, we can find the concentration because we know the concentration that we started with, 0.5 molar, and how much we used, and together these add up to the overall volume of 3 milliliters, so we know now what the new concentration will be. So this concentration, 0.0417 molar, is what corresponds to an absorbance of 0.22. Given that information, we can then find epsilon, plugging in those numbers here, and we get an epsilon of 5.28. And then if we have an unknown molarity solution, but we know the absorbance, and we know the epsilon now, then we can figure out that the concentration would be 0 0.072. And your TA can help you with those if you have questions about how to do those problems. In class today, uh, you'll be doing a spectroscopy simulation. You may actually do it outside of class because uh, the skills videos will be happening in class. But um, essentially, you want to watch for the photons of light that come from the left and see how many of them hit this right side of the box. And we're going to call those transmitted. And the ones that don't make it there, we'll call absorbed. And this depends again on the identity of the gas and also the wavelength of light. So you can adjust both of those things with this simulation. When you do this online, this left side tells you the procedure. And if you scroll down on the left side, it has the questions where you can answer those questions to generate your report. You'll want to do this together with your lab partner so that you can talk about all of the things that you're seeing in the simulation and come to a consensus about what you think the correct answers are. Another important thing that you're going to do today is performing a serial dilution. And serial dilutions mean that you start with one stock solution and then you dilute it, and then you use the new solution to go on to continue to make the other solutions. So a couple of things that are important here. Number one, you have to make sure that you do everything correctly because if you mess up in the first step, it's going to carry through to all the other solutions that you prepare. And you have to start over if you make a mistake. Number two, you want to make sure that you're actually measuring the liquid volume very precisely and correctly like you learned. 
using the bottom of the meniscus and you want to have exactly the amount that you're supposed to have. Um, if you add too much water, you can't undo it. So I recommend when you're finishing off the last uh, half a mil maybe of your dilution that you use a pipette and just add it drop by drop uh, till you get to the place where you have the bottom of the meniscus just exactly at 10 milliliters on your graduated cylinder. The third thing is because you're putting the concentrated solution at the bottom of the cylinder and then you're adding water on top, you have to make sure you mix it up really well and I recommend using a pipette, squeezing the pipette while it's out of the solution, putting it into the solution, sucking up liquid, and then squeezing it back out gently into the solution to mix it from the bottom to the top. You'll want it to appear a pretty solid color all the way. You don't want to have any visible gradient of color because that's going to mean that your, your solution is not well mixed. In your pre-lab, we asked you to calculate these volumes, and these are the volumes that you should get for your pre-lab. Um, you'll use that C1V1 equals C2V2 equation. So go ahead and check those right now with your TA. You want to make sure that you have this planned out carefully so that when you do the experiment, you don't make a mistake and have to start over. In class today, you should wear long pants, closed-toed shoes, gloves, goggles, and a lab coat, and also a mask. A couple of the chemicals we work with have some warnings associated with them. Copper to nitrate can cause irritation, so it gets the exclamation point GHS pictogram. Nickel to nitrate is an organ and reproductive toxin and a known carcinogen, and this one is one that you want to be concerned about if you are pregnant or may be pregnant. You shouldn't use that solution, so your lab partner should help with that part of the procedure. If you have a question about that, please talk to your TA and they will give you instructions for what to do in the lab. Cobalt 2 nitrate is also a germ cell mutagen, so again, should be handled with caution. Be careful when you have gloves on not to touch your face. Don't eat or drink in the lab and be sure to wash your hands thoroughly prior to leaving the lab. And if you have any accidents in lab today, make sure you report them to your TA immediately. There's several things that you'll want to do um, at the end of today before you come back next week, and your instructor will show you all of those things so that you can be prepared to accomplish them. Okay, thanks very much, and have a good day.